up guys? I'm Jeff with BFE Adventures. Um, today we're going to discuss KTM 1190 and answer some of the biggest questions we get about this bike um, on rides. So let's dive in. Alright guys, after riding multiple adventure bikes, I'm going to give you my insight on this one. This happens to be my personal bike. Um, I've ridden, ridden uh, 1250 GSAs, um, Super Tenere's, just got to ride Alex's Africa Twin uh, a couple weekends ago. Um, some smaller adventure bikes, CB500X, stuff like that. Um, V-Strom, I rode those, Triumph Tigers. For me, this bike does exactly what I need. I got hooked on this bike um, four years ago. I actually was at a middle of the map adventure rally put on by Skunk Works Moto, and I got the chance to ride one of these amazing machines. And ever since that day, I said I would own one. So about three, four months went by, and I went and bought this one. It's a new leftover. 14 that I had bought in 16 um, brand new so all the miles that are on just over 21,000 now I put on myself all the maintenance um, done by me or uh, with the help of one of my motorcycle mechanic friends um, it's a great bike haven't had any issues with the thing at all um, you know it's just it's a fun bike. It's KTM. You can't go wrong with the KTM. But comparing this bike to every other bike, if you want to go out and you want to do wheelies, um, just kind of goof off, you know, flick it around like a dirt bike off road, this is the bike to get. There's a couple reasons why I feel that way, and I'll explain some of the pros and some of the cons of this bike. Um, we'll start with the pros. One of the biggest things for me that sold me on this bike is the power. It's undoubtedly the most powerful adventure bike in its class. This does have a programmer on it. It does have a uh, Rottweiler intake. Um, it's decatted, tuned, um, emissions delete, all that kind of stuff on here. But we dyno tuned this one to the wheel in uh, normal street mode it made 135 horsepower to the wheel on a chassis dyno so not that you need that I mean no one ever really needs it in a bike that weighs you know next to nothing for an adventure bike I think it's one of the lightest ones out there um, but it's just crazy how fun and how light this bike is for what it is third fourth gear um, the thing just pulls like crazy. Fifth gear, the thing pulls like crazy. Sixth gear, it just pulls like crazy. The power that this bike has, the sounds it makes, um, it just brings a grin to anyone's face. Um, Cody, Alex have both read it, and they'll agree it's probably one of the most fun bikes they've ever rode just for the sheer power. You know, that's not to say that, that a... Uh, BMW 1200 or Africa Twin, stuff like that's not a fun bike. They are. It just doesn't give you the instant oomph and the oomph, instant hit of power that this bike does. Um, it's absolutely insane. Anybody who has not had the chance to ride one and needs to ride one, if you're ever out with us or on a ride or whatever and you want to ride it, just ask. I'll be more than happy to let you ride the bike. <clears throat> Let's go to another pro. For me, the dirt bike feel. It feels like you sit on the bike instead of in the bike like you would with a BMW. Um, Alex's Africa Twin, I feel like you sit on top of as well, but not as much as this bike. This has more of a dirt bike feel to it. So when you're standing up and you're off-road and you're going over jumps or whoops or jumping logs or through creeks, it feels like you're on a dirt bike. The weight on this bike is so well done when you're riding you can't tell the bike weighs what it does so KTM knocked it out of the park on that 
Um, the 1821 setup that's on it, just like a dirt bike, again, feels like a dirt bike off-road. The ergonomics of this bike, I did have to put handlebar risers on here, so it does have a one-inch riser underneath the bar. This is stock bars. Um, it just made it feel a little bit better standing up, otherwise they felt a little bit too low to me. I know guys will say, oh, you know, you put handlebar risers on it, it changes the geometry of the bike, or slings your weight forward, or back, or however you have it. Well, that might be true, but guess what? I'm no Jeremy McGrath, I'm no Ricky Carmichael, I'm no Ryan Villapoto, I'm just a guy out there trying to have fun, so I can't tell the difference. Another plus of this bike is the stock suspension. Um, it does have WP suspension, I believe Explorer 48 forks. I could be wrong, but I'm almost positive that's what it is. This is stock suspension still. Um, here in a couple weeks, I am going to have it redone by Shock Zone Suspension, who Jim Metter is my suspension guy. He's done all the bikes I've had. I've lasted four years with this one with stock stuff, and I'm going to do a couple different things, have it revalved, resprung. Um, I'm a shorter guy. might maybe lower the bike a little bit. Uh, this is the R model, so it is the taller one, obviously but it does have some ground clearance that can be given up for a short guy like me. Another pro that I like about this bike, um, the traction control, ABS, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff on this works phenomenal. You have four different modes as far as selection. You have a street mode, a sport mode, a rain mode, and an off-road mode. And then your traction control, ABS, you have traction control, um, different setups there, ABS, you have on, off, off-road, um, some stuff like that. This does have heated grips on it, KTM heated grips, I added after the fact. Same thing, easy plug and play behind the headlight assembly, plug them in, run through your computer, turn them on, flawless. Um, it's just, it's just a, a well-made bike, KTM knocked it out of the park. Brakes on it are phenomenal, uh, 320 millimeter full floating up front, both sides, um, rears, rear obviously not 320, but still great stopping power. Uh, there's there's nothing more you could ask for on this bike. It's, it's, it's really one of the best machines I've rode. Comfortability wise, um, stock seat, not that comfortable. I've got accustomed to it just because I rode a lot of dirt bikes uh, in my lifetime. Gotten used to this one with 21,000 miles on a stock seat. We did a, almost an iron butt the first day to Colorado. It was like 960 or 980 miles from St. Louis where we went to Colorado to our Airbnb. And I'll be honest, I wasn't liking it at the end of it. The butt was a little bit sore. Uh, okay, a lot of bit sore. So if you're planning on taking long trips, I'd invest in a, a nice heavy duty seat, aftermarket seat. Um, as far as that, the, the bike did great on the trip. Uh, I had more, I wouldn't say really off-road tires on it, but I had a Shinko 804 in the front. Yeah, I think that's what it was, Shinko. A Shinko 804 in the front, and it was a uh, Midas E07 Plus in the rear. Um, still handled great on the road, being loaded down, making the trip. It was like a 3,000-mile round trip to what we did, and tires held up great. Bike felt great. Um, it handles better than you would think being 2118s on the street you would think it would kind of wander a little bit which it does a little bit higher speeds with a knobbier tire on it um, these are Dunlop Trail Max missions that are on this bike now that I'm currently trying for a set of them happy so far the rears got uh, a little over 2600 miles on it and it's just starting to show a little bit of wear in the middle which is very good for this bike normally it eats up a back tire the way I ride in about 3000 miles so very impressed with it. I can't really complain about the tire setup, um, how it rides, stuff like that. I know a lot of guys say, uh, you know, do you ever get tired of riding this? Do you ever wish you had something a little more comfortable? Do you ever wish you had, you know, a BMW to ride on these long trips? It would be nice on a long trip, you know, if you're trying to just knock out miles on the highway because they get 300 and something miles to a tank, I think. Eight, Point four gallons, eight and a half ish gallons, something like that, 8.9. Uh, this bike is 6.4 gallon tank and loaded down, you get roughly around 220 miles to a tank on the highway. So I wish the, the fuel capacity could be a little bit bigger, but overall, 
not bad. Um, after 220 miles, you're ready to get off, you know, take a bathroom break stuff anyways, so. Let's talk about some cons of this bike. There are a few. Um, one of the most commonly addressed issues on the internet that you will read if you ever look at purchasing a 13, 14, and 15 especially, I think the newer ones are better, um, but 13, 14, and 15 had extreme airbox dirt issues, like sealing. So they would get dirt past the airbox, past the air filter, down into the filter stacks. Um, first thing that I did when I bought this bike was put a Rottweiler intake on it and so far I've been lucky haven't had any issues with dirt ingesting in the engine but it is definitely a must-have at least get rid of the stock garbage system um, I think uh, Unifilter might make one that's just a drop-in filter kit um, not sure but if you ask me, Rottweiler is the way to go. They specialize in KTM stuff, so they know what they're doing. And one of my other gripes about this bike is to clean the air filter. In order to clean the air filter, you have to take half the front of the bike apart. So, tank bag's got to come off, seat's got to come off, this fairing has to come off, this fairing has to come off, this fairing has to come off. Um, there's another fairing up there that's got to come off. There's like 4,700 screws that have to come off this thing. And you take all these off, you have to undo your gas tanks, well, gas tank, but both petcocks on each side, turn those off, disconnect the fuel lines, disconnect the plug for the fuel pump and stuff on the left side of the bike, pull your gas tank out of the way, and then there's your air filter. So it's quite a lengthy process. It's not something you're going to do in five minutes. It's going to take you you know, a couple hours to do, to clean, um, re-oil your filter, let everything dry, all that kind of stuff. So, big pain in the butt, big gripe about that on this one. Um, not happy with doing that all the time, but it is what it is. The second thing, stock skid plate on this from the factory is garbage. Don't even know why they put it on there. So right out of the gate, got to get you a good skid plate. Again, uh, Rottweiler Performance. Well, not skid plate. Skid plate's actually Black Dog Cycle Works, but um, RNG engine covers. But the Black Dog's Cycle Works um, skid plate is a not. I wouldn't say that this one exact brand is a must, but it definitely is a must to get it replaced. The um, kickstand on the left side of the bike, not the center stand, but the kickstand, is mounted to the engine cases. Um, not a good design, KTM. Not a good design at all. So I went with the Black Dog Cycle Works because it moves it off of that and goes on the bracket for your foot peg and for the skid plate gets it off the engine case. That way if you drop the bike, it doesn't bust your engine case open and then you're broke down on your trip, whatever. So quite expensive. Um, I think when I bought this, it was $600 skid plate with the relocation bracket. Also came with the uh, kick and bypass switch. Um, that's another good thing. Might not be a, a gripe for a bunch of people, but a gripe for me, the stock KTM crash bars. Why put them only down here? These upper ones are Touratech add-ons that I did to protect the upper part of the gas tank. But why do they stop here when clearly this stuff is going to hit the ground too? So to me, these were a must as well, seeing as how, I mean, I'm a short guy ride a tall bike, can't touch the ground a lot, you fall over, it is what it is. You'll see me do that if you ever go on a ride with this. Um, stock lighting, not that great. Um, halogen bulb, need to upgrade it. I haven't yet. I have put Denali fog lights on. I just run those. Um, takes care of the issue. No big deal there. The stock exhaust, the stock muffler is ridiculously huge and heavy and I don't have it anymore in the garage where I would show you but traps a lot of heat so got rid of that um, I'll put on that one that's actually a Delcovic slip-on muffler yeah everyone's gonna say Delcovic it's cheap blah 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 it is cheap but it's held up it's been um, about 10,000 miles now and I'm getting ready to repack it finally for the first time uh, 
Haven't had any issues with it at all. This bike has a lot of heat that comes between the legs, which is another gripe of everybody and another gripe of me, especially in the summer and winter. It's kind of nice because it's like a built-in heater. But all the engine heat comes right up through here and right up in your legs, soaks into the seat. Um, stock, there is some heat shielding underneath here, but doesn't really help. Your legs will get so hot from the heat on this bike. So just be prepared for that. There are some ways to get rid of it. You can do the cat delete. You can get some different headers on it, um, wrap it, which I haven't wrapped the exhaust yet. I just got used to it. I wear motocross boots most of the time, so I don't really notice the heat on my legs just right in this area. So basically I'm baking my beans, if you know what I mean. So you guys might notice that. Um, oil changes, I don't know what they are on a BMW, Africa Twin, you know, Triumph Tiger, something like that. But this one, you're looking about $100 for an oil change every time you do it. Um, filter, four quarts, full synthetic, and there's two oil screens you need to clean every time. So make sure you do that. Um, another gripe, another gripe, another gripe. The stock windshield. Okay, everyone says, why do you put this big hideous V-stream on there? Well, the reason the big hideous v-stream is on there is because whenever you're riding an hour or two hours to get somewhere to ride off road or even ride in general you want a little bit of wind protection this is your stock windshield it's supposed to be about like that that's not much wind protection is it great when you're off road yes because it doesn't get in your way it's not a chance of it hitting your helmet or whatever but if you're cruising down the highway at 80 miles an hour, you're gonna be blasted with wind, uncomfortable. So I do keep it that way. If I do have a day where I ride just off road, I'll swap it back on, but most of the time it's not on the bike. That's pretty much it for the cons for this thing that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, you will notice, actually, yeah, there is one more thing. You will notice on a long trip, or even if you're just going down the highway, you know, anything above 60 miles an hour, when you're sitting on the bike, when you are sitting on this bike riding down the highway, you will feel a lot of wind come up on your torso right here. And for some people, it's kind of annoying. Um, if it's cold out, obviously you don't want that because you'd rather keep the wind off you to stay warm but summertime is kind of nice, but you do feel a lot of wind that will channel around this tank and go right into your torso. The rest of you isn't really too affected. I'm five, six, five, seven, something like that. And this V-Stream, this is their mid height and it does perfect just getting the air over the top of my helmet. Um, I had a Mad Stad one before this and it just kind of moved a lot and you can feel buffeting off the off the windscreen going down the highway. This one does pretty good. Can't really complain about that. So what do I think of this bike as far as should you buy one? I can't answer that question. Can I tell you it's a well-made bike? Yes. Can I tell you there's some flaws? Yes. But that's to be with any bike. Um, I mean the maintenance on this bike might be a little expensive compared to like a BMW that you might get into or maybe an Africa Twin. I don't know. The bike has 21,000 miles on it and honestly I haven't done much besides change the oil. Um, I have cleaned the air filter regularly, oil regularly. Um, I did have the valves checked um, 20,000 miles so I'm almost 2,000 miles ago. But not one valve was out of spec on this. I know the manual tells you to have them done by now, um, adjusted, but this one did not need any. It does have new chain and sprockets on it. Um, I put those on 20,000 miles. I mean, some with 130 horsepower, it's gonna wear stuff out. If you don't like spending money on tires, don't buy this bike. You're going to, plain and simple. You're heavy on the throttle everywhere you go trying to have fun. You can't ride it just to behave. You always wanna have it in sport mode. It really just kinda of depends the person you are. If you're one that just wants to go out, leisurely cruise, you're not really looking to ride anything off-road aggressively, you probably don't need this bike. Go buy you a GS. Go buy you an Africa Twin. But if you want like the all raw out power that you can get the most fun, this is the bike to go to, um, in my opinion. So if you buy one used, 
like I said, look at the skid plate, see that it has one on it, or if it doesn't, get one. Um, ask the owner, you know, what kind of intake setup do they have on it. If they say they have an aftermarket one, if they're willing to sell the bike, ask them if they want to take all this apart and you can check it. You know, that's if, if they want to sell the bike and they're truthful, they might do that. I would, if someone asked me, I'd have it apart and ready to go for when they get here or take it apart when they get here so they know that I'm not hiding anything from them. But as for me, this bike isn't going anywhere in my stable. It's paid for. The next thing that I'm going to add in the stable, hopefully, is a 1290 Super Adventure. So we'll see when that comes along. But for now, this is my only girl. If you guys have any other questions, comments, uh, go ahead and post them below. I'll be happy to help answer. Um, anything you want. So thanks guys. We'll see you next time.